don't get the support, laissez-faire economics, with few, if any, moral restrictions upon entrepreneurial behavior. On the other hand, Republicans do support severe limits on social and sexual behavior, severe limits on social and sexual behavior, including speech, press, dress, abortion, and homosexual marriage. The Democrats reverse the process. Democrats support a laissez-faire, hands-off approach to speech, press, and sexual issues, at the same time that they insist upon severe restrictions upon economic behavior. Now, the, I want to make something clear. The restrictions that Aristotle and Burke are referring to do not necessarily involve the government. We're not talking necessarily about laws. Because if Aristotle and Burke distrust human beings, for the most part, they have to distrust government, which is made up of human beings. So what Aristotle and Burke are talking about are sense of communal standards that they hope will ultimately be reflected in the government and its laws. So tell me your name again. Michael. Do you have any questions for me? So which party represents the authentic traditional Western conservative approach of Aristotle and Burke? Is it the Democrats or the Republicans? Republicans. You'd say? Republicans. And, and the reason is? Generally, they like conservative minds that Aristotle would like to see. Yeah. From an authentic point of view? So explain that mindset to me. Because that's my question. Which of the parties represents an authentic, traditional, Western conservative approach to life? Well, let me ask you this. If you understand what I'm saying, because this is hard stuff, and this is the first time you're, you're confronting it, so I understand that. I just want to make sure that you're following me, because it is difficult to understand. According to Aristotle and Burke, to which kind of behavior do moral imperatives apply? Well, that's exactly what I mean, to what kind of behavior? Is it economic? Is it sexual? Is it social? Is it what? Social. Uh, for them, I guess it would be more economic than from what they said. Well, let me stop one more time. Because this is difficult. I don't mind doing it. But traditional conservatives who do not trust human beings in any way, shape, or form, they believe in communal moral imperatives that apply to all aspects of human behavior. And the key here, of course, is all. If they don't trust human beings in their attempt to make a living, they sure as hell don't trust human beings to do what they want in terms of uh, speech and press. You understand? Yeah. Any questions? No. So with that in mind, which of the two parties uh, more closely represents and resembles the traditional conservative approach? Neither, really. Well, that's the point. So, Dago, what is, from a philosophical point of view, what is the, is there a coherent explanation why the Republicans reserve moral imperatives to social and sexual behavior, but not to economics, and the, and the Democrats reserve moral imperatives to economic behavior, but not to social and sexual behavior. Is there any philosophical explanation for that? Is there a coherent explanation for that? Well, for Dagle, Dagle? The social stuff, the ones that I see, are then basing on religion, like for pro-life, it's the fetus as a soul. For same-sex marriage, it's the Bible says homosexuality is abomination and stuff like that. Yeah, but what about speech and press? For that, I guess it's, I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure it's true, like conservatives a lot like, I remember 
seeing it on Facebook. I see you like earlier today or yesterday saying that like desecrating a flag isn't like actually protesting. That it wouldn't like not be allowed. So it on it's Facebook. Like, what is that mean? Uh, there's some there's some article where someone arguing about that. Well, that forget about that for a second. Let's talk about <laughs> David. Is there a philosophically coherent explanation? For why Democrats reserve moral imperatives to certain forms of behavior but not others, and Republicans reserve moral imperatives to certain forms of behavior and not others. Is there one that you can think of? I'm thinking. Now you we know that they do it. I mean, yeah. it's a fact. Is there a philosophical reason why both? I want to know is there a philosophical explanation that would explain that? That, those distinctions. This means distinctions. That's a philosophical <laughs> subject. <laughs> distinctions. Well, think about it for a second. Could everybody in the back hear me? And we, you know, it's, it's not like we, we have a lot of time, so you can think all you want. You know, you sit down and you write like ten pages of a speech, right? And you're saying, well, this will last 60 minutes. Like, I'm almost finished with what I wrote. You know what I'm saying? Have you ever done this? Were you ever in a speech class? It's yeah. over like in one minute. You're saying, I wonder if there'll be enough time for me to <laughs> say all these things. What do you say, David? You want to keep, continue to think about it? Yeah, to think about it. I'm kind of conservatives seeing that the thought process of going out of the 60s, 30s was typically much of a conservative tradition, but at the same time, What do you say? I think the, the way I see it is Republicans. I want to know is there a logical explanation yes. in this? Remember, this is the famous Stomach book. I, I, make I a think, distinction here. I think it's going for an idealized version of, of America. I think, and in the, in the mind of a Republican, you go with the economic, their economic point and their. Uh, moral point because at some point in our past, like looking at the let's say, 50s and 60s, they see it as a more as an idealized time period that had superior qualities to to so look, look, things were better in the past than they were today. You said the 1950s. Yeah. Would you have had grandparents living in America in the 1950s? How idealistic was life here for them? They were uh, dirt poor. Is that it? There were a lot of people who were dirt poor in the United States in the 1950s. I mean, it was good. I mean, I mean, as far as like what? I mean, uh, they, 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 they would help them out. That's one thing. Um, they were an oppressed minority. Yeah. Did you, you, you don't remember Jim Crow? Or you didn't read about? I, well, I mean, I've read about it. I mean, there were a lot of dirt poor people in this country in the 1950s, but only. Uh, only African Americans had to go to separate bathrooms and separate schools. So, so these great times that you're interrupting referring to were not so great. Sure. Well, uh, so, but I, but I want to know: is there a logical, is there a logical reason for this? I, I don't want an explanation for why they do it, because you can give all kinds of reasons. I want to know: is there, in terms of logic? What do you say, Osborne? No. Are you sure? Yes. What do you say? No. What about you? Well, there really isn't. I mean, I mean, they do it. You can't deny that. But there really is no logic to it. The logic the Republicans would say is, well, the market works in a magical way. How did Adam Smith explain it? The invisible hand. Yeah, there's some kind of magic. There's a godly, providential force that the laissez-faire economic system will always ensure that the economic system will stabilize. But that has been disproven by history over and over again. I mean, what happens over and over again where there are no, forget about government laws, where there are no moral restrictions on economic behavior, what happens always? The, it's only good for rich people. Well, the powerful people blow everybody out of the water monopolies and trusts, 
And so the whole idea of competition upon which the capitalistic system is based on is completely destroyed. And that explains the Great Depression of 1929, explains the tremendous depression of, the, uh, of 2007, and on and on and on. So that is their explanation, that there's this magical force. In, you mentioned in religion, religious people believe in God's providence, that eventually everything will work out for human beings because God loves us. Do you understand? So what laissez-faire economists have done is that they've taken this religious concept and secularized it. That the capitalistic system will always take care of us. Well, whether you believe that or not, this is a violation of religious thought. You just can't do that. That's not the, that's not the original root of religious thought. <coughs> now, that's what Smith did. There's an invisible hand. And by the way, in the book, The Wealth of Nations, which was printed of all times in 1776, invisible hand has a capital I and a capital H in it. So you know exactly what he means. In capitalism, God will always prevail. If you just, if people and their morals and their governments and their laws and their mores and their folkways just keep their hands off the marketplace. So forget about economics. That's a violation of religious thought. That's not what religious thought is based on. Okay? There's no indication in the Bible that God had, who created women and men and mountains and sparrows and rivers and oceans also created the law of supply and demand. There's no mention of that in the Bible, in the New or Old Testament at all. So I want you to understand there's no logical distinction. There's no way to logically, we know that they do it, but there's no way to logically make that demarcation, neither for the Republicans or the Democrats. Now, the one group that's consistent on this is the Libertarians. The Libertarians say there shall be no restrictions of any kind on any human behavior. Well, that's what they say in theory. So the, new, the guy who's running for president now, under the Libertarian banner, Rand Paul is going to find that uh, that ain't going to work. Now, he learned his politics from his father, who was a doctor. What kind of doctor? Do you remember? OBGYN. Yeah. And he came out very, very quickly against abortion, which was, in, I mean, look, rightly or wrongly, this is completely in violation of libertarian policy. So there's just there, there really is no there really is no uh, logic to it all. There's no coherence to it. Are there any questions? Do you understand? We know that that's what they do, and we know what they say, but it can't be justified through coherent logic. So because of this failure of philosophical coherence, conservatism in the United States has fragmented into a number of competing factions. They're the social conservatives. These are the ones who believe in laissez-faire and economics, but they want severe law restrictions on abortion, homosexual marriage, speech, breath. They don't even want to tell us how to dress. Who, uh, Dinkle, who are some politicians that you usually associate with social conservatives? George Bush. Which George Bush? The uh, junior. No, that's not true, as a matter of fact. 
who's the number uno on this? Ronald Reagan. And, and, and more recently, you watch morning, the morning news, this guy, uh, Joe Scarborough, morning Joe. He's so that's one faction. Another faction, uh, uh, that, this is why the Republican Party is just broken apart, because there's no explanation for it. There's an explanation, this is what I say, but there's no logical explanation. Then there's the Tea Party. So who are some Tea Party men? Who are some names that we can associate with this philosophical discussion? Oh, Ted Cruz. Yeah. Sarah Palin. Sarah Palin, Michelle Bachman. Michelle Bachman, exactly. Exactly. Then there are the neoconservatives. These are the people who believe that the United States has a God-given mission to spread its uh, way of life all over the globe mission that requires military force if necessary. So who would be the leader of that group? George Bush. Well, there you go. George W. Bush, the last part of it. Absolutely. But this attitude goes all goes back centuries. What was it called? The first that moved us across the manifest that yeah. manifest yeah. and how it spread it was all across the world. Okay? Any questions so far? I'm not, I'm not asking you to agree with me, I just want to make sure that you follow what I'm saying. So this is what American conservatives think, which defies logic, and that they're, they're called conservatives, but I want you to understand within the context of the history of Western civilization, they're not conservatives. So what are they? Well, let's put it one more time. The, 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 the philosophical distinction that, that, that historically you make between authentic conservatives like Aristotle and Burke and authentic liberals like Locke and Jefferson, that one group emphasizes moral responsibility to the community, the other group emphasizes individual freedom. Okay? So with that in mind, if Republicans are not conservatives, what are they? What are they? Spiritual conservatives? They're liberals. liberals. What do you want me to tell you? The Republicans would be right-leaning liberals. And the Democrats, with their laissez-faire approach to speech and press and sex, sexual relations, for example, are left-leaning liberals. Both of them stress individual rights, applied to different spheres of human behavior, it's true, but individual rights. They're both forms of liberalism, left-leaning and right-leaning. Yeah? Can you say that they're also um, conservatives, just right-leaning and left-leaning? Well, why wouldn't I say that? Because they don't apply moral obligations across the board. Because the their aspect. definition fits more with liberals than it does. That's exactly right. Okay. Are there any people that you could identify today as being um, traditional conservatives? There are, and, and and they're very influential. And whenever they speak, they draw enormous crowds. Right, Osborne. Me. I mean, they really. You see, traditional conservatism has no. It had no past. It has no present. It has no future in this country. It's reserved for people who study Aristotle and people who like Aristotle and Burke and take their writing seriously. There aren't very many people like that, and the ones that do don't get involved in politics. Imagine me making a speech in a one-minute uh, appeal on TV. I'm running for governor, and I'd like to explain to you as quickly as I can and not what I'm representing. There's no hope. There's no hope for these traditions. They never have existed in, in anything resembling.
assembly large numbers. They don't now anymore. Do. And the reason is, help Matt David. The reason is, uh, why are they not big? Because people don't like this approach. <laughs> but why in this country don't they ask more? Well, the people who came over here and founded this country were extremely individualistic people and would not believe anything like that. Anything they were optimistic. They, they, that's right. They were individualists. They kind of classed. They were optimists. How else would you describe a group of relatively poor people who are sick and tired of being of having their Protestant their uh, Calvinism oppressed by Henry VIII and the uh, Church of England. Remember, we're talking about the beginning of the 17th century. Who, who don't have much money, they hire a drunken captain, drunken crew. They get on these crappy old rotting, leaking boats and go across the Atlantic Ocean. At a time, there are very few people who went across the Atlantic Ocean successfully. Yet they had no doubt that they were going to make the trip. Where were they going to land at? Well, they didn't know. Plus, these people were farmers, and they left in the fall, which meant that if they lived through the trip, any land they set their foot on, it would be too late to plant the crop. So they had no problem. They were going to make it across the ocean. The drunken captain, drunken crew, leaking boats, boat, Mayflower. Somehow we'll find something to eat. We'll go to Win Dixie and get a frozen pizza or something. And what about the natives who aren't too happy? I mean, all of this stuff will work out. God will take care of us. From that very moment, Osborne, as you correctly point out, Americans have been the supreme optimists. How do I know that? Well, I told you the story about the, our first settlers. I told you the story about the, about the frontiersmen the same kind of confidence started heading west. Nowadays, we have no problem sending 100,000 troops to foreign lands in the Middle East, for example. And we're certain, despite the fact that these people have lived in their areas of the country for thousands of years, and Americans have lived for a few hundred years here, those people have established ways of life for thousands of years. We have no doubt, just like our ancestors, the Puritans and the frontiersmen, that if we send 100,000 troops to Iraq, within a month and a half, they'll be playing baseball, eating apple pie, and singing God Bless America. So there's no hope for traditional conservatives in this country at all. Because that's just not, not our worldview and never has been, never will be. What's, what's the link between traditional conservatism, or what's the disjunct, rather, between traditional conservatism and optimism? What's that mean? Well, traditional conservatives feel that an optimistic view, a worldview is unrealistic. They read history and they see in every epic the amount of man's inhumanity to man is just remarkable. For liberals, every year become, and progressives, every year becomes better than the one before. Every, every decade century becomes better than the ones that came before. The 20th century is marked by two events. I mean, a lot of things happen in the 20th century, but there are two defining events in the 20th century. The first is the Holocaust. And the 
second is the Americans dropping the atomic bombs on Japan twice. Those are the defining moments because nothing like that ever happened in human history. People have always hated each other as individuals, and groups have always hated each other as groups. And oftentimes, people and one group has tried to wipe out another group in its area. But never in history has one group tried to wipe out another group all over the world. That's the Holocaust. You understand? Number one. Some people incorrectly describe the atomic bomb as, as just a very powerful weapon. Well, it's more than just a powerful weapon. It has some kind of other How would that happen? We even know how would it happen. Oftentimes, they, they, they talk about nuclear weapons as being so many thousand pounds of dynamite, but it's, it's because weapons have become more savage over the centuries. But this goes beyond, it's just, just like the Holocaust, it's different than all other killings of one group by another. You understand? One group didn't say, I'm going to conquer the whole world, and wherever I find these people, I'm going to gas them. That's never happened. And oftentimes, they've killed out a whole group in an area. So for example, the Turks wiped out millions of Armenians. But they didn't say that they were going to go all over the world and find every Armenian, even in Mobile, and murder them. So that never happened. This weapon is more than just most powerful weapon that was ever invented. It has this other world we hear. We even know how this would happen. Tell us. Well, yeah. Well, it follows the, the yeah. theory on how the dinosaurs died out. Well, it's the uh, detonates and if nothing detonates, they create like clouds and trees or. Well, do you understand? All this dust rises, he says freezes, which is an excellent explanation, because it blocks the sun off from the earth. So what happens next? And what does that mean exactly? I, I, want you sh I want you to understand why, unlike liberals and progressives who think that times are always getting better, in fact, they're not. And the last century was perhaps the worst century in human history in terms of man's inhumanity. Do it step by step. So now the, the sun is blocked from the earth. So the first thing that's gone is plant life is dead. Right? Right? So that means all the plant eating herbivores are dead. When the plant eating herbivores are dead, that means that the creatures that feed on herbivores, the carnivores, are dead. And the only species left are cockroaches. Everyone knows that it's just impossible. Nothing can be done to kill out cockroaches. There's also some idea that if, if, if it was a world war and all these countries like Pakistan and Iran and so were to all drop these nuclear weapons, theoretically it could knock this earth off its orbit. all these planets crashing. It's really more than just a powerful weapon. So traditional conservatives lacking this, everything's going to turn out all right attitude. That never had a place in this country because we have that attitude that everything somehow is going to turn out all right. God will provide. Instead of God helps those who help themselves, we say God will provide. What perpetuates that kind of blind optimism or that boundless optimism? It's been like 400 years now, right? Like longer in this country. What perpetuates that? In the 1980s, when my kids were growing up, if you asked them a difficult question, they would answer with one word, they would say, Today, whatever has changed into another saying. 
if you ask someone a difficult question that they have to think hard about and worry about, now it's, they say, it is what it is. And you heard that a lot. Who wants to worry? Be wor what? Be worried. So you think it's apathy? It's, it's more than apathy. It's a self-defense mechanism so that people can sleep at night not be concerned about things that really intelligent human beings should be concerned about. It's not just laziness is what I'm saying. There's a, there's a reason for it. There's a rationalization for it. Don't bother me about this. I don't want to think about this. It's too, it's too vexing. Whatever it is, what it is. That's what people mean when they say those things. It's a kind of immaturity, you know, when confronted with all these difficult issues. So I, I would say I'm pretty optimistic. Um, it's, I guess it's kind of more like, you know, all the, all the big problems uh, of our past will eventually kind of figure it out. That's, uh, I'm confident, like, uh, we'll figure out a way to fix problems in the they thought they thought uh, some people were like, worried that Ebola was going to be the, you know, was going to kill just mass millions of people. But they, but it eventually got figured out. You know, it, 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 it's a, I guess it's, for me, it's sort of a, uh, a confidence that at some point someone's going to find the right answer. Well, I mean, that's the way. I mean, that's the way you feel. What am I supposed to say? I mean, but you understand what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely.